back to the dating game. And Patrice, we've reached that moment now when you have to tell us which one of those three wonderful fellas over there gets the date. Will it be Bachelor number one, Bachelor number two, or Bachelor number three? During his appearance on The Dating Game, the comedian and performance artist Andy Kaufman deployed a fatal strategy. Rather than play along and be led by the questions of the lovely lady whose task it was to select a bachelor, Kaufman decided to go to extremes by playing outside the framework of the dating game dialogue. In his foreign man persona, he made himself an absurd object of pity. Andy Kaufman deployed a fatal strategy in the 70s and 80s as the old Fordist approach to managing capital broke down and the neoliberal turn began. Andy Kaufman pointed out that there were no grand narratives, that we were all basically children, and that there was no way to win the game. The way to understand the concept of the fatal strategy is to understand Andy Kaufman and his appeal. You mean I did not win? I did not, no. Come on, boss. No, I won. No. No, I won. But I, I won. I was, I, I won. No, you didn't. But I answered all the questions right. <laughs> no, Patrice, I did. Patrice didn't choose you, Bosh. But I, but I answered all the questions the right way. Come on, over, Bosh. No. She'll, she'll give you a kiss. No. I did not do. I, he does, I want it. He doesn't answer. want to meet you. Let me tell you something about the bachelor. Oh, here he comes. Come on, Bosh. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see... We still, them. to a large extent, live in the interregnum between so between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. Susanna Kleeman is the author of the novel Twice. She is currently working for a book uh, for Sublation Press called Fatal Dates. It's a list of datal tip, dating tips. What is it? I mean, I always get it it's, wrong. I just want to call it I fatal dates. That should be the title. I'm sorry. We're, I'm retitling it as your publisher. It's now called it's fatal called dates. Fatal dates. What? But it is. But I, I'm calling it fatal dating tips because it's a very practical guide. It's dating tips, and and you know, it's got all right. Fatal dating tips. A practical guide to finding real love and sex in an unreal age. Okay, that's better. I like all of that. Um, and so, uh, but you were also the, uh, host and, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you were the hostess of Fatal Dates, the... I'm the hostess. I don't, you hostess, were, it's got, it's No, got that's not the word I'm looking for. No, it's not. It's, it sounds hooteresque, I would say. I'd say that I'm the host of Fatal Dates. You're the and, host of um, Fatal Dates. Or, but you were also the... The the uh, you know the the geisha of fatal dates. You were the you were the um, the uh, you you supplied uh, narcissistic um, enjoyment for the men who participated in your in your I experiment. Narcissistic enjoyment. I don't know that I would put it that way, um, and I don't know that I was always a geisha. I certainly, a, when I was you, interviewing you, it seemed to me a good strategy to to appear as a geisha. I don't know why, Doug, but it seemed to me that, that that would elicit some interesting responses. I, I don't want to talk too much about what I am have been doing in Fatal Dates because it, a lot of it is secret. And if I told you what my thought process is in it, I think it would spoil it. But but um, certainly what I, am, what I was doing in Fatal Dates is playing up to um, heterosexual men's, what I understood to be heterosexual men's, to some degree, fantasy of heterosexual uh, women and I have to say, as a, as a serious intellectual, doesn't often wear makeup. Um, uh, it, it, you know, dressing up as a geisha isn't something that I've often done in my life. But can I tell you, I really enjoyed it, and um, it was an interesting experiment to do. It took up a lot of my time, and because I'm writing my book for you, Fatal Dating Tips, at the moment, 
I'm, I'm not doing the show anymore. I don't know if you noticed, but but I, I'm yes, just yes. writing my book instead. The many interesting things that I've learned from reading Baudrillard is um, power is reversible. The ideas that we have and are best perhaps exemplified in our time by Michel Foucault and his books about power, society, sexuality. And um, the problem that Baudrillard had with Foucault, in fact, he wrote a book called Forget Foucault. And the reason that he says we should forget Foucault is because he says Foucault presents these things as monoliths, you know, a terrible master-slave relationship, that's what we're in. And what Baudrillard says is, well, that's not true. That's a hyper-real take. The truth is, as we all know, that the power of sexuality and, and other sorts of power too, not just the power of sexuality, but for example, the power of sexuality, although women may be and may have been in the past much more, it's up for debate, but, but may, may be oppressed and have less rights than men. In fact, women, if they choose to, some women, perhaps not all women, can exert a tremendous amount of power over, over heterosexual men, so much so that, that all the power that heterosexual men, you know, the jailer in the women's prison, a man, you can get that man to, do, to, to set you free, perhaps, if you're a certain a heterosexual woman who can understand how to play the game of that man. What, what, what Baudrillard says is we're much more free than we might like to think we are and that, that things like Foucault's analysis and work just make true something that isn't true and, and are in prisons in themselves. And what we should understand is there's a lot more freedom and Baudrillard's word for it is reversibility than we might like to think. And certainly what he says is a power that women have, perhaps intrinsically, but also because of the ways that heterosexual men have dealt with it in history is a power to overturn anything. Therefore, one of the things that I've understood from reading his books is because this is true and because heterosexual men have felt very vulnerable and threatened, because perhaps at some points in the past, uh, heterosexual women were having a different sort of life. In fact, there is an argument to be made that says all of you know, the Western society that we know from classical times to Roman times to medieval times, feudalism, enlightenment, bourgeois society, those are attempts by heterosexual men to try and say, no, it's only one way. We have power. We can decide which of these women we're going to go home with tonight. They have no power whatsoever. But he says it's a desperate quest. And he also says, a, a way above and beyond anything to do with sexuality, he says, it's not news to you in the sublation media channel. There's a crisis, therefore, of being the subject, of being the one who desires, of being the heterosexual male. And nobody wants to do it anymore. That game has played out. Nobody wants that responsibility. Nobody wants to be in charge. And that, that's the situation that we're dealing in now, whether or not we can admit that. One of the characteristics of what the self is, and one of the reasons it's under siege, is we're interpretive beings. And now, by the late 20th century, we're in a situation where interpretation has never been more difficult. Never been more difficult. One can, I mean, I can name artifacts that we've developed technologically that are almost completely close to interpretation, and I'll name one. Although we attempt to interpret it. Television. Television tries to interpret itself to us, bypassing the upper brain functions and directly feeding into our minds. This is why I said off camera between classes that Orwell was a, was a pied optimist. 1984 arrived in sort of the early 70s, and, uh, and, and, and Orwell's vision of a horrible future, which was a, a boot stomping on a human face forever, is a utopian image because he assumed there would be resistance and human faces, both of which may turn out to be false. I'm going to just say kind of obvious things. Um, that might seem uh, very conventional, um, but it, it seems to me that uh, what distinguishes like modernity and and uh, you know contemporary society from what uh, occurred in the past is that uh, pre precisely uh, that this uh, notion of a subject of an enlightened individual has risen up, and that it 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 this did not define society in the past that the whether you want to call it a masculine subject or a heterosexual white male or something else that this individual uh for the free individual subject with agency um is a new development and one which uh is the foundation for the kinds of freedom that we tend to to value 
today that that uh, without that, what we'll return to is some sort of communal authority, probably based on mythologies or religious sensibilities or um, a reified understanding of the order of the universe um, uh, rather than our own human subjectivity and and uh, our own reasonable, reasonable, our own reasoned out desires. Well, I would say I, I, I partially agree and I, I partially disagree. I would say the democratization of that ideal has been something that's happened, you know, since perhaps we could say since the Enlightenment. But but it's always been the ideal that at least a few people have at the top of society been able to be individual subjects. In this, I'm thinking particularly at the moment of Marcus Aurelius. I've read his meditations. Those are the meditations of a subject. Those are the meditations of somebody working out for themselves in a way that is very modern and very human. Um, what it is to be a person, what it is to be a subject, what it is to be a ruler, all those sorts of things. And it may be that he lived in a very stratified time and it was not possible for other people to attain this enlightened position that he was in. But I would not say that, that people didn't have ideas of themselves as agents. I absolutely wouldn't say that at all. Um, and I would say that, um, you know, the medieval history that I've studied is, is, a, is a great deal of men, popes, merchants, Usually it's male voices, but women's voices also of trying to work out what their subjecthood is, how they get by in the world, how things happen. So I think it's a bit simplistic to say, Doug, that um, it's just a modern idea that we've had that. And in the past, people were what? What were they then? They were just sort of monoliths all existing together like ants in a hive with one hive mind. I don't think that's the, that's the case. Well, you know, the the return of the Roman and the Greco-Roman ideal uh, and the kind of humanism that people discovered or rediscovered there uh, informed the Enlightenment. I don't know. I'm not a scholar on Greek and Roman history at all, but I it, it um, seems to me that we, that the, the Enlightened subject pro, kind of projected uh, the values of the Enlightenment back uh, onto Greek and Roman uh, history and also were inspired by the different kind of pre-Christian humanism okay. that they so, discovered so, there. So so it's always been there. Perhaps what's most different is this that perhaps what underpins all of this is is um, well it's, uh, it hasn't always been there. I mean the thing about the Roman Empire or the uh the Greek uh period is that it was defined by urban civilization, which would mean <clears throat> that you know it was defined by uh, certain forms of technological development, roads, um, uh, sewer, sewage treatment, um, mass living, people living together, close okay. together. Okay, forms but we, of but, democratic forms of government. It, but it's but it was also defined by writing and recording systems. So what, mm -hmm. if what you're saying is in the countryside it wasn't like that, I would say, well, how do you know what it was like in the countryside because it just hasn't been written down. But um, I've got no idea. But what, what I would say to you is I think it's not really, I think what underpins it is science. And I think really until, um, say, the late 19th century, there was always an idea of advancement in science. Okay, there were a few dark ages, but there was an idea that it would be possible for us to know more. It would be possible for us to learn more. And there was an idea of, you know, there was an idea that some people knew almost everything. Um, and I think for, for me, what I think is that um, it's, the 20th century and, and our own time, when we discover that the universe is much stranger than we think, that they, you know, when quantum physics comes into play, when things don't connect properly in the way that they ought to, suddenly the very thing that was the, the, the if you were a man trying to find a place that was ordered, stable, made you feel less vulnerable, you might cling and peg your hopes to science. But when science in the late 19th century and the early 20th century evaporates into something really strange, then, then what do you have? And I, I, I'm not a scholar of those things. I'm not a scholar of very much, but just the very minimal reading that I've done around those things of, of, of echoes so much, I think, of how we feel ourselves now, which is nothing makes sense. There's a terrible disorder. Things like postmodernism make sense, not just intrinsically to me of themselves, but because of the scientific mess that has been opened up, the underpinnings of it. Like nothing makes sense. Nothing add up, adds up. The, our worlds don't make sense. What do you think? Is that just wild, hypothesizing, Doug? I don't think it's wild hypothesizing. I, um, I guess what I was saying before was that what changed to create the, you know, what you call the 
heterosexual male subject or I imposed upon you as a heterosexual male subject. You, um, you, the heterosexual male subject, imposed on me something that I hadn't said. But anyway, carry on. Well, you've said it in other conversations, not this time. But but the uh, the the I would just call it that subject the human subject, whether it's male, female, black, white. It's a human subject. Um, the human individual, the reasoning, uh, self-responsible human individual. Um, what I was saying was that that idea of freedom and self-responsibility arose up historically and politically, and that uh, we could, you could point to earlier political forms that ha- you know shared similar terrain, but that uh, I would want to claim that today's uh, subjectivity and individualism and individuality, all of that are historically unique. And it's not just a matter of human nature overall. And and then the other thing I would say is that this feeling of um, the world not making sense and everything being mysterious and the, the erasure of the division between science and magic or science and mythology, all of that is actually a consequence of a political failure more than it is a uh, uh, something that's arising from human now, nature is, or the a physical I have to say, realm. That isn't what I said, and I'm always alert uh, when I talk to you. When I talk to your fellow Marxists, fellow Marxist podcasters, mm-hmm. I understand that some of the things I say suddenly words that I never said get introduced into the dialogue, like magic, like um, mythology, like mysterious. You know that those are very traditional pegs to put on women who are saying something a bit different. And can I just say, I don't like them. And I've, I, I have got nothing to do with any of those things. And, okay. uh, and well, we'll I, see about that, Susanna, no, we'll whether you have, <laughs> you've had something we'll to do with them that. or not. No, okay, uh, but okay. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you something that I think. I think that as religion dies, and it's hard to find satisfaction in life for all of us, right? Mm-hmm. All we want, for God's sake, is something that's going to make us feel a bit better. Sometimes that's alcohol and other things. Sometimes that's religion. Sometimes that's status at work. But but something that we all have is sexual organs, and something that we all have is the hope. Most of us, the hope of 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 having having something good come out of having those sexual organs. That seems to be a button that we all got to press. You don't even have to go to the off license in order to uh, acquire it. Um, mm. And I think that sometimes, um, you know, again, we should talk about what are men and and what are women. Mm-hmm. And the the definition that Baudrillard gives, and and that's a useful place for me to um to fig leaf behind, is um that men it's got nothing to do with bodies. He says, although he doesn't always say that. He says men are the ones who desire, and women are the ones who are desired, and that's got nothing to do with your body parts. And he says it's ridiculous because in the end, desire it doesn't exist. That's that's another liberating thing that he says. He says it's it's kind of a cosplay. But nevertheless, it can be a pleasurable and satisfying cosplay. And if you're a man, you desire, you see someone who you desire, and that's perhaps if you're heterosexual, living out the heterosexual fantasy, someone who who, who posits themselves to you, not as a fellow person who also wants to have their turn desiring you once you've done desiring them, but someone who offers themselves to you as a desirable object and might even dress to make themselves even more desirable for you. Someone who wants to fulfill your desire. That seems to me a very good definition of um, heterosexual, the heterosexual fantasy and heterosexual relation. And, and it can be very pleasurable. Of course, it can be very pleasurable. Of course, you have to re- we have to remember that it's a fantasy and a role play, a very ancient one maybe, but it's a fantasy and a role play that makes it much easier to deal with. But I think that it, it has become, when you don't have much else, when you don't have religion, when you don't have a standing there, you still can have this, this place where you could desire and meet someone who wanted to be desired by you. And that could be a very nice experience to have. And I think that that as other things fall by the wayside and there are less pleasures, that's a pleasure that becomes more and more and more something that we might want. And of course, what though what happens in our own age is it becomes less something that we might want to actually do with somebody else and more something that we might want to think about doing with somebody else because how easy it is to have um, to have, see those things on the internet, to see virtual versions of those things and not necessarily to have the real things themselves. I think we strayed somewhat off the topic here. I want to go back to why you objected to my characterization of what you had said before as uh, an erasure between science and magic. What, 
What was that that you didn't like? What was it about that character? I'm, I'm not talking about anything to do with magic. I'm not talking to do. I'm not talking about any mysterious force of ladies. I'm not talking about glades where women meet at night and perform, you know, certain things with herbs that might. Enti- I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about any of that gubbins. I'm not talking about anything like that at all. Um, I, I completely agree with you that the idea of um, atomized individual human beings, all of us with our own special little desires and our own individual ways of wanting that and our own very bespoke sexualities, and our whatever. I, I do think it, that that exactly mirrors different political affiliations that we might have. And I do think it's, it, 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 for me, it doesn't appeal and it doesn't ring true at all. It seems to be playing into the hyper real fantasy that we could all, it, it seems to me a, a, in the end, a story about meta tags. We all just want to tag ourselves to the nth degree in the hope that we can meet people with similar tags and form a connection. That seems to me to be an illusion. And it seems to me the, the ever greater attempts to define ourselves, be that by social media profiles, meta tags, intense psychotherapy, anything else is a lie because I think, you know, who we are as, as people, as characters is a bit more fragile than that. And if we could just hang ourselves up and exactly as you say, connect as human beings on a more simple level, um, that would be the way forward for us to create better societies than it would be to ever define ourselves further and further and further. To go back to the uh, this magic science split that I'm I'm trying to talk about, uh, I'm not claiming that you are literally, you know, advocating for some return to Wiccan witchcraft or something like that. I'm 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 claiming that uh, the way in which we ha- when we end up deciding that the world is so complicated that any claims to understand it are authoritarian and imposed rather than reasonable and not only reasonable, but something that can, we could have public access to. Go ahead. I don't think that at all. I don't know where on earth you got the idea that that's what I'm saying. I don't, I I don't think that at all. I think what this comes down to is a disagreement. It's a, it's a, the disagreement that, classic Marxists have with what Baudrillard says, as I understand it, what classic Marxists say is the the path to freedom is to forget all things that cause a layer of mystery where you have to hang up your logic, reason, religion, ideas about caste, identity politics, ideas about sexual desire, ideas about hyperreality. As I understand it, the objection is, no, everything is very practical. If we get rid of nonsense of gubbins if we just focus on what are the practical realities of the world that we live in and therefore how could we practically build on that um yeah and that's fair enough but uh, uh, but i think and and the objection as i understand that 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 classic marxists have with with baudrillard is he says no you can't do that because now there's this layer of hyper reality due to virtual media that's come on that's distorted everything well you know what, what he's really saying is that um, you're not being realistic enough, that he, you know, he would agree, you as a Marxist, he would agree. You've got to analyze things as, as accurately as you possibly can. And that is the project that he is still involved in. And what he says is you have to understand that the Gubbins has affected theory and affected political analysis too. The, the tool themselves, the microscope that you're looking at all of this uh, stratification of society, how things are, is, has become suspect. It itself has become infected. That people, for example, want to cosplay being Marxists. They might not be able to admit that to themselves. The people for years and years might want to say, I'm a Marxist, but they might not really want to have a revolution. They might just like talking about those ideas. And that's become increasingly allowed in our societies. Or, for example, people saying, for example, I support Jeremy Corbyn, but yet not actually voting for him when it comes to it. And people permitting themselves that lassitude. That's what he's talking about when he talks about hyperreality in politics. He's saying, you know, let us also analyze theory itself. He's saying that's become all gunked up also. And an and analysis of why that is and how it is, is, is required and necessary. And that seems to me eminently practical. Why not? Okay. Yeah. So this is, this is good. This is good. So let's dispense with the word magic and mythology and instead talk about ideology and yes. maybe culture instead. Yes. So, yes. so there are these cultural values, these ideological assumptions which are necessary and which are operative, but which we can't uh, simply reason our way out of because they may become prior to our reason. They, they, they... No, if, if we're talking, if, if I'm here to pass Baudrillard for you, that's not what he says, it's not at all what he says. He says you absolutely can analyze it and he gives you his whole work as a tool of analysis for it. The objection to him is not that, that he's saying 
it comes from, it's beyond our control. That's not what he's saying at all. I mean, very briefly, what he is saying is this. We are human beings. It is in our human being nature to want to look better than we do at certain times. Sometimes that's because we want to attract people sexually. Other times it's because we just want to look better than we are on the world stage. And it's also not just individual, but it's cultures also. Everyone wants to look good for the Olympics. Everybody wants to look like they're a nice, caring society. And uh, he says that's just human nature. But he says that a difference in our time is technologies that de has developed that actually allows us to see versions of ourselves spouting these things, looking better, having filters on us in a way that didn't happen before. And what he says is it's worth looking at that beyond an individual vanity level. It's worth looking at that on a societal level. When things can be tweaked visually, what does that mean? How does it play out? What cannot be tweaked visually? And he's not saying it's an inevitable force. He's saying we must analyze this thing and we must be, we must be prepared to, 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 you know, to go to the nth degree in our analysis of this. We must be prepared to see what it even does to people who call themselves Marxists. You know, we have to really follow this to its, to its nth degree. The objection to him is not that. For me, an objection to him is he says sometimes, not always, he's quite epic. He, he says he's not a theorist. He says he's a metaphysician. And, and he, can, he says maybe this is just our human destiny. He says, maybe they're just cycles of history where we, we start out trying to make something good. After a while, we become obsessed with looking at the, the video of us trying to make something good. Yeah. And we try to make the video look better, detached from the actual work that we were supposed to do. And then our societies fail, everything is, is destroyed, and then the cycle begins again. That, to me, is a more serious objection to him, that he seems to be fatalistic and pegging what we're doing to ourselves to the forces of the universe. But it's not because of saying that culture can't be analyzed. On the contrary, all he's doing all the time is analyzing culture. But he, he, he's not. The reason why I ultimately really do like him is that although he suggests this fatalism, it's not really what he's up to. And he says there are ways through it, but the ways through it are by analyzing very thoroughly, saying objectionable things and causing people who think themselves to be, say, for example, the highest revolutionaries at the brink at any moment of causing uh, you know, overthrow of the state to truly look at themselves in the prism of the prisoning culture that is one of hyperreality, and say, is that really and truly what you're up to? Be honest about it. And he says the way to do it, he says that discourse, and in fact, he says there is no sublation. Um, he says, you know, there's no dialectic, there's no sublation. But he says those things in and of himself, because what he's trying to do is his technique, which is what he calls fatal strategies, trying to challenge you. He's trying to like a Zen koan, say. He's trying to hit you in the face so that you wake up. You know, he's writing in a certain way. He's writing in a way that is irritating. He's writing in a way that is florid and is more like the work of a, a great writer than it is the work of, of you know, a, a, a sentence by sentence Marxist analyzing, theorizing everything. He's saying things that you might go, it's an outrageous thing to say. How dare you say that? How could you say that an, a table has more power than your average white man? Which he does say somewhere at some point. Because all the time he's trying to, he's just trying to say, wake up. What does he mean when he says that? What does he mean when he says a table has more power than your average, does he say white man? He says, you know, he doesn't say, I can't remember exactly what he says, but the, he, oh, then, then someone who, who sets themselves up as a subject, which in his parlance means your, your, your average white man. I like you. You're a hell of a piece of furniture. A table has a use. He has a fantastic bit in, in Fatal Strategies and in other books where he says, objects have now, are getting their revenge on us. Not just objects, as in people that we might objectify, pretty women, pretty men, but objects themselves, all the, the plethora of much too many objects that we have, your beautiful handbag, this lovely plate, they're all glowering. That's his word. They're glowering at you. They're having their revenge on you. They have a purpose. They, they're useful. You can do things with them. That's why he says that it, 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 in sexual relations, it's the one who's the object who has all the power because you have a desire for that object and the desire and, and that object can feel satisfied that they, they, they have a function. At least they have a function and they could choose to fulfill that function or not fulfill that function. They could choose to play with you. But the poor subject, the average white man, doesn't, you know, they have no purpose. They're in existential terror. They've set themselves up as the people who can be logical, do all the theory, be the science, be the sensible ones who in the end can control our society. But that's all blowing up in their face. Poor them. They, they, they have, they, they, their whole being is staked on being the ones who know, being the big daddies, being in control of a completely uncontrollable world, uncontrollable on so many levels for so many reasons. So they're in existential despair. But at least the, 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 the ones who are wanted, okay, fine. You, you, you want me to lie here wearing this, doing this? Fine, fine. If that's making you happy, fine. You know, simple. Was he a metaphysician or a pataphysician? Which was he said, he said, I am 
a metaphysician, a moralist, and a pataphysician. And, and I think that he was all three. Okay. Definitely so. so. What did he mean when he said he was a metaphysician? He's, he, he likes talking as one, and I would suggest that it's a game for him. And he, he says he writes to provoke. He's, he, he has given himself the authority to talk like some biblical prophet, to talk about the fastest cycles of human history that we could not possibly know. And he, well, not even just to talk about them, but to kind of hypothesize about them. He says, you know, what are we all doing here? Is it, is it our fate that, that to, to destroy ourselves? Do we have a fate? Is there a destiny of humans? Is our obsession with wanting to look good everything that we're about? Is what we wanted to make all the time a virtual world that we can perfect because the real world was too complicated? And we can step into this virtual world that we control by numbers, that, that is made of pixels, that we can craft to look exactly as pretty as, as, as Kylie Jenner's Instagram. Is, is, is that what human destiny is? Because to have a controlled world, even if it isn't a real one, is much better than having an uncontrolled world where we're going to die, where we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, where we're at the perils and, and mercy of all sorts of different things. So when he says he's a metaphysician, what he means is he will let himself talk in these big terms, which other people might be too embarrassed to talk about might feel like mm, people might say, well, you know, why on earth are you saying that, mate? You, you, you've got no leg to stand on. You're just shooting the breeze. So that, that's why he says he's a metaphysician. Uh, he says he's a moralist because he is saying some, he's, he's trying to wake us up and, and, and that's a very old fashioned thing to be, you know, to be a moralist. He, he's saying this is it's not going to work out well. This is not going to give you happiness. He's, he's not being neutral. He's not being, for example, postmodern. And, and he's often tired by people saying he's postmodern. He's not saying, everything's as good as anything else. He's absolutely not saying that. He's very clearly saying some things give more pleasure than other things. Um, he's saying it's a kind of hopeless quest, but he says some things are better for you, give you more pleasure, are chime better with your higher soul than other things. So, so you should like him, Doug. He's a very old-fashioned conservative. Well, I, no, I do like him, but, um, and I'm not a conservative, by the way, but I like him maybe because he um, does have some value. It seems to me to to embody some values, which I don't think of as being conservative or traditional, but being, but maybe are perceived that way in our postmodern world. They're actually modern, bourgeois, you know, enlightenment kind of values. And one of the things about the enlightenment and those kinds of bourgeois values is that they're actually quite tricky, and they um, well, require. You, but but let me let me just let me ask a couple of questions because uh, I have something I, I want to respond to everything you've been you've been saying. But and the way I want to respond to it, I've come up with a fatal strategy of my own, and and um, that is to ask you about beauty and uh, desirability uh, and the ideology of sexiness, maybe, because it, it seems to me that historically, and I, and I I could be wrong, maybe, I know that there are um, Evo psych people who would tell me I'm completely wrong, but it seems to me that what is considered considered to be a desirable woman, what, what female form is considered the most uh, sexually compelling, um, has changed historically, mm -hmm. that there, was, there are times where, and we're, we may be going through a moment right now where the, the that uh, the beauty standard is changing again um, there's a time where being extremely um, maybe muscular and thin and um, waif like is considered to be uh, the highest ideal for a woman um, uh, almost an androgynous look uh, is it dominates the culture you get figures like Twiggy back in the 60s or Kate Moss in the 90s and then there are moments where being more full-figured and curvy and maybe even on the verge of being plump uh, is what's considered to be uh, the most attractive uh, way for a woman to appear. Um, and that these things change, and they don't change based on the will of the public alone, or it's not just that we get bored, but rather the conditions which set up that ideal in society change um, and when they do then our our ideology of beauty falls along after so when for instance being rather plump and full figured um, uh, meant that you were uh, likely to be able to uh, not only survive but to live well that it uh, reflected a, a higher station then that was the beauty standard and then later on when 
having the leisure time uh, available to you to control your diet and exercise and be in good shape um, indicated that higher stations than being thin and waif-like and maybe a little androgynous was a higher beauty ideal. Um, and these things change based on, uh, you know, on more subtle levels, uh, based on, again, on the material basis or the, the, the cultural, social, and political needs of the society. And so these, and they happen kind of after the fact. Um, okay. So what I would say about that is, in my opinion, um, sexual attractiveness has got absolutely nothing to do with bodies. All the stuff that you've just been talking about, about bodies, and I will get into it and talk about it, is... Well, I don't think that has to do with bodies, uh, because the body changes. It has to do with the communal values. It, but the communal values pretend that they're about sexuality, but they're about something else. And I want to talk about that, but I just want to say something else to begin right, with. Right. For me, what I think is that um, sexual attraction is... is you, can be, you can be whatever shape, and you can be amazingly sexually attractive. It's got absolutely nothing to do with your body, and it's got nothing mm -hmm. to do with trends of bodies. What I think it's got to do with, and maybe I just talk here about myself personally, it's got to do with putting two fingers up to the world. Your sexual, the degree of sexual attractiveness that someone has, and I think that's why bad boys, Kate Moss, bad girls are, are, the, are you know, and when you, see, when you see models, just clothing models doing anything, they're always, what they're doing is they're not smiling. Hi, they're not smiling and looking their Sunday best. They're looking, and that's what Kate Moss is absolutely brilliant at. I would say that's also what Rihanna is absolutely brilliant at. What they're saying is, fuck you, fuck this world. You know, I'm, just, I'm not interested in this. They are elsewhere. The, the, the quality of being sexually attractive is being elsewhere because it's the truth. The quality of being sexually uh, attractive is being truthful and honest. This world is nothing. It's just a bunch of old stupid nonsense. Yes, I understand. There's a lot of material issues. Everything is wrong in it. And that is in many ways because people are not honest and say about it. So the capacity to say, fuck off. And to communicate that with somebody where you're both saying fuck off to the world in the same way is what makes is, is what sexual attraction is about. That's my personal view. As mm -hmm. for bodies, shapes, and how they change, the lie that is sold to us, and so much of it is about beauty industry. You should be wearing this foundation. You should be wearing that foundation. You know, I, I, I have spent a lot of my life not wearing any makeup at all. I feel tremendously free and happy. And I want to laugh when I sometimes see the amount of money ads, all the creams and potions that I ought to, 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 to be using. It just seems to me a massive con of the highest order. So because we all want to find a sexual attraction and not just sexual attraction, but an actual connection, a partnership, there are all these embrocations, which we're supposed to take, do diets. You know, this is, as you said, this is just, this is part of ideology. It's not part of attractiveness, but we're all sold that it's part of attractiveness. It's really got nothing to do with attractiveness. And in fact, spending your life trying to find attractiveness and find a partner by investing in this sort of stuff is actually going to really inhibit you ever finding anything because all it is, again, is about you in a quest with yourself, you in dialogue with yourself, you building up yourself, either by beauty products or reading self-help books or, or therapy. It's about you in discussion with yourself until you're good enough. You're already good enough. Everybody is already good enough. You just have to be honest and, 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 and truthful and know about it. As for why in this day and age, there are different body standards. Something else that I have learned from reading Baudrillard, you know, I could have read it in many other places. And you've said to me, and it's true, that for me, I've just read a lot of Baudrillard and not so much of other people. I could have found this material in other people. This is, this is the train that my passion's gone through and helped me to, to really focus my thoughts and, 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 and to work out what I think. But something he's shown me is that in the past, we were talking about binaries. And that's a very old-fashioned way of looking something. Men, women, master, slave desire desired. And um, the project of, of our time, which is a project that is inextricably tied up with virtual worlds and technology, is a project of there only being one. The project saying, and which is, I also understand, a Marxist project, a useful political project, but a project that says we are one sort of thing. And the differences that we have in our genitalia are actually very minimal. You know, I, I can hear that argument. I, I, I can see it. But it's part of a larger argument that says there's only one sort of thing. What will let you be is many different flavors of that one sort of thing, but you're all one sort of thing, which in his, the word he uses for the, the, the imposing structure that says there's one sort of thing is the matrix. That's what, you know, the matrix is a movie that is built out of his ideas. He says, we all can live inside the matrix like ice cubes in an ice cube tray. We can be different colors. You can be a, a, a gay man living in Portland, Oregon, who likes keeping rabbits. I can be a, an anarchist living wherever I want to be, who's changed my gender. We're all different. We're allowed to be as different as we want. You can wear a hijab. I can, you know, knit my own beards and do whatever. 
but we all have to respect the matrix. We all have to be equally different. That's the violence, he says, that we all can be equally different. And in, in a world that's like that, there's a tremendous push, therefore, for our underlying structures to be more or less similar, for there to be a somewhat more androgynous look. And it's also very natural for there to be a vast reaction against that, um, especially when what is played out often in very, very commercial spaces like Instagram or fashion, TV, that sort of thing, is what he calls cold seduction, which is when you use the previous tropes that had a lot of power, which often can include, for example, large breasts, huge buttocks, and you deploy them for your commercial ends. And then people who are like, for example, Kylie Jenner, the Kardashians, Cardi B can understand that by having even more, and you know, surgery allows you to do it, developed assets in this way, it can, it, it can bring you more cash. And so on the one hand, a, a sense of androgyny, and then on the other hand, a sense of layers put onto that androgyny, which can be prosthetics, which can be filters and makeup, which can be a disguise thing, but, but that tell us, but actually underneath it all, this person's all plastic surgery, this person is more or less the same size as we are. And the, the powerful message that I've got from Baudrillard is things are not all the same. The matrix is just an idea. If you go along with it, as perhaps Foucault did, then you're doing the work of the matrix itself. There are ways around it. There are things that can disturb the matrix, being rude, saying terrible things, having a very strong pronounced sexuality and using it to wreak havoc. There are, as he says, fatal strategies that come in from other places. And some of them are very, very frightening and unappealing in every way, fatal strategies. But he says, don't believe what the matrix says. And there are many, many ways to get shaken out of it. Okay. <clears throat> so this claim of um, uh, that there are many different um, ways to be that there is not one overall matrix. When put next to Baudrillard's claim to be a metaphysician, strikes me as very interesting and contradictory, maybe even. But, now, but what, I, what, I, what I, well, well, let me let, let me explain why. <clears throat> um, because um, when you are a philosophy of a philosopher who's interested in ontology or metaphysics, what you're looking for is the ultimate substance that uh, defines and explains and supports and is existence. It is what it is to be. You're, mm -hmm. you're looking for that ultimate substance. So a metaphysical uh, substance is the, uh, the kind of substance that everything uh, is or requires in order to be. And <clears throat> then there are lots of different theories about what that substance might be in the history of philosophy. Onto, you know, the first ontological premises were things like everything is made of water or everything is made of fire. Um, later on, it's like everything is thought or there's really own, like or really radically someone like Parmenides would say uh, all there is is one substance and all difference is an illusion. Um, there is no change. There is no different differentiation where everything is simply the one unchanging thing. That is an ont a big ontological claim, a metaphysical claim about the universe that uh, demands that we ignore our own senses, right? But most ontological claims wouldn't make that kind of demand. They would say, oh, no, the, there's a world of appearance and then there's an the underlying world of reality. There's a metaphysical realm which supports the apparent diversity and that there is a sort of ontological basis of, of the universe, that there is a substance out there in the external world that exists and that defines what it is to exist that that okay. supports reality and so as a metaphysician he uh is making some sort of claim about uh, what it is to be and okay. and I, what I he's saying what is what he's, what he's saying is what he's saying is there is no, no one way that's to not be. what he's saying what he's saying is his his the, his definition of what it is to be his vast mess of physics is based on this there is the reason we exist is imperfection. If the world was perfect, the beginning of his book, The Perfect Crime, says, <clears> if the world was perfect, it wouldn't exist. That we're here as error and imperfection and asymmetry. That's what he believes. Um, mm. So what he believes, perhaps, perhaps then you were right, what you were saying before. Perhaps when, when, we, when I, I said, no, it's not about the Jews. Well, he, say, he says, you cannot know everything. And he says, an illusion of our time with our computers is that you can know everything. And then... The things that you can't know, um, what, what Wittgenstein says, whereof you cannot speak, what, what, whereof you cannot, what does Wittgenstein say, Where, whereof 
you cannot yeah. what what whatever you can't speak you're about like you're forbidden to speak of you know yes. whatever you yes. can't speak about yes. You're yes. Forbidden but what he speak. says is what what Baudrillard says is we've taken that and we say that we translate everything into a place where you can find information and data a pixel based world a virtual second world and everything that doesn't fit in that we won't talk about it anymore um for a vast array of reasons and so what, what he is saying is that the attempt to, to, to put everything into science and maths, to write everything, to note everything, to make a perfect system is always going to not, not be true. That the, that the reason that we're here is, is, is imperfection. That's what his metaphysics is about. And he's not saying that there's a thousand different sorts of people. He's not. He's absolutely, you know, he, he's got nothing to do with identity politics. All that is anathema to him. That's not, that's not what he's saying. He's saying identity politics and the kind of secret fanning, oh yes, tell me in your individual way how you're so different to other people and how I can support you in your rights. Yeah, he completely says that is, that is a tremendous hyperreal mask that stops you from therefore looking and analyzing society properly because it's turning you inside yourself so that your own selfish little world is what, is, is what your lifetime's project is and it stops you from being able to connect with other people. He's absolutely not saying, you know, but, but what he is saying is not everything can be reduced down to exactly the same thing because that would be perfection. That, that things miss. He says things are asymmetric. He says some things, unacceptable though it might may seem, have more power than other things. Some of the things that have more power than other things include in his world tables, women. You know, unacceptably perhaps, what he says is women have much more power over men than men have over women. And if there's been a reaction to that, it's kind of, you can understand it. And the reaction to that has possibly been Western society, male-dominated Western society. So that, that, that's very interesting to me and liberating to read. And it's not the same thing. Therefore, you can't reduce everything down. But to go back to what you were talking about, about principles of androgyny, it's, it, 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 to me, it does seem that the attempt to make men and women the sort of feminism that is normally called feminism, you know, feminism in, a, in, a, in and of itself, is actually a way to, to, to reduce women's power because what it's saying is, okay, we'll let you come and be temporary, honorary men like us. You don't have to exert your other power, which is a power of saying, fuck off to the world. You can come and be part of the project now. We could talk about that at length, I'm sure. Yeah, well, let's say, well okay, so I want to go back to the, I want to address this idea that a table has more power than a, uh, than a man, right? Um, or a subject. Um, which I don't think should be equated, but which you're kind of equating or Baudrillard sort of is equating here, making women into objects and men into subjects. Um, so the reason that, from my Marxist perspective, the reason it's true to say that a, a table or a coffee cup or you know any given object in the world, that, uh, that especially objects that can be bought and sold, have more power than any individual man is because those objects are uh, uh, embodying value and are exchanging in the market at, at roughly equal values in a, in a way that determines how those men are going to act. Yeah, and what and he so would say, what what he would say is, you are deformed by capitalism. You're Marxist mind is forged within capitalism that teaches you to see things in a quite ugly way as solely about production. That's not to say it's not a very useful analysis to take that analysis of production to its nth degree and completely necessary work. To say that that is the be all and end all shows your mind deformed by living in a world of production. That, um, that things that are more, that are not, that you will not permit, that it's not just about the way it's made, the way the value it's given to it, that it is also about things to do with, for example, playing that, that and got nothing to do with the production value because you, you, you would see it in your, as a classic Marxist, flippant and frippery to bring notions of play into what you're doing. What he says is far from it, that those things are massively important. And you, by not incorporating that sort of thing into your analysis, you render your analysis useful only to a certain degree and very unattractive to the people that you want to attract to your project, ordinary people, because they intrinsically know there's more to it than this. And this is a very reductive, boring, untrue way of dealing with the world in the okay. end. Okay, but um, the, right, well, there, uh, it is not the case that um, the value embodied in, the abstract value embodied in uh, commodities like a cup of coffee, uh, or a table, um, are all that matter. 
even from Marx's warped capitalist point of view, that's not the case um, at all. If those items did not serve as useful values as well, if they, if I couldn't drink the cup of coffee, um, or I had, and, or use it in any other way, if it served no social purpose, or to me as an individual or anyone, then it would not embody the abstract value. Of but, everything, but everything is still predicated on 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 really old fashioned notions of being a subject. Something I find it's difficult to talk about, and and, and but but. It, it, so much, perhaps, of what you're saying, and maybe I'm being unfair to you, is predicated on this idea that it's not good to be used. But unfortunately, for some people, it is good to be used. I'm and not. I'm not. I'm not saying anything about being used or being bad or good. In fact, it's not. You know, I, I, I haven't made that claim at all. I'm just. I'm just describing why I think, from a Marxist point of view, it's true that objects like a table have more power than individual subjects or individual workers or men or have what have because those the value that they embody through the process of production determines what will happen again in the future um, and not the per people who are doing the work okay so but what you're saying is not this that's a perspective and it is a good and interesting perspective but that's mm -hmm. not got some, anything to do with what Baudrillard is saying about but I want to I want to have one more point and then I'll give you a chance to take it apart the other thing is that it is not uh, a man who simply is trying to uh deter the direct um the world of objects uh that is the power that is really determining the world nor is it simply the objects as useful things that are really determining the world, but it is this abstract thing called labor that that both men and women now own their own labor power in society. Anyone should be able to get. Not everyone can get a job, but by in legally, in theory, anyone can get a job. Anyone owns their own labor. Anyone can be paid a wage to work, and then you can work any job you want. OK, you're not limited by your birth or your station or your gender or your race and what you're allowed to do to help produce the world. You any job you want, you can get. And it's all basically the same because it's all paid a wage. It's money. It doesn't it's not like you can only get the things that are useful for a certain okay, but, kind but, of work because of that, who you that's work. That's a very narrow definition of work. I would say that today there's a lot of different sorts of things that are work. One of those things is our wage labor that we do. But I would say that a large proportion of people who live in countries where computers are plentiful and they have access to, you know, easy and often free technology, another big part of people's work is their public image, okay? And um, the, the, the work that people are doing, people, if, and, and also work in the future, perhaps many less people will work, uh, you know, also in corollary because machines will take over what that work is. And I think that whether people are conscious of it or not, it's coming a time where work recedes. And, but the work that we cause ourselves to do in order to look good on screens, in order to attract work and new jobs, so in order to gain all sorts of connections with all sorts of different people, that, that is a very important mode of work. But it is not salaried work, although people do it in the hope that they're going to win the lottery and it's going to become salaried work. But I think many, 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 many people are much more involved in that kind of work than are involved, you know, than, than are in, really care about their careers, that their careers are just a way to finance that kind of work. And, the, the, you know, there's much more held out a dream that, that what never existed before, that if you do this big, if you, if you get your own YouTube channel, you won't need to do those other sorts of work before. But all of that work is work about self-image and it requires you to learn technical skills, but they're increasingly easy to do. And, I, I, you know, that is a place that, he, that Baudrillard is giving me an analysis of. And I'm not seeing classic Marxist talk, you know, hands up. I haven't read enough stuff. I don't know. Maybe it exists and I'm talking complete nonsense and there are plenty of analyses of this sort of thing. But that seems to me the real place where people are doing work. They're doing work on themselves. They're doing work on themselves. They, and I mean that even to the extent that they're doing plastic surgery on themselves. They've come to understand that, that self-commodification is a path forward. And that is something that Baudrillard talks about, not just Baudrillard, other people, very interesting, Boris Groy is very interesting. But that's that's beyond the classic work of Marxism, unless I'm very ignorant and mistaken. No, I I, I do think you're, okay, you, everything you said up to what that, that it was beyond Marxism 
It was true. <clears throat> like everything you said, yes, people are doing work on their image. Yes, um, people compete with one another to be able to get that paid job. Um, and that's in the labor market. There are all sorts of ways that you can compete. There are all sorts of values. Um, Prince Harry is going to have a lot easier time due to his birth and his station being employable, you, yeah, the, you know, the, especially the in the say, world. It isn't even that there's perversity in it. It isn't just to do, people are satisfied with that work, even if it doesn't bring them money. Getting likes is a sort of virtual money. You know, it's it, it's a way that says you have a place, you exist, you function in society, you have importance, you have influence, you know. And that goes beyond just that. And to say that's just nothing and that isn't what controls the world and there are deeper forces, of course, we must never forget. And, the, you know, the very superficial world of, of, of digital media, definitely there's not a lot of programs going on apart from, of course, the Noble Sublation Media Channel about an analysis of exactly what's going on there. But the analysis also has to factor in these things, it can't not, or else it totally alienates a wider public that should hear about these things because they understand that that's what they're all up to. It, I'm not saying that's what they're all up to, but for many people, that's what the satisfactions are. It's not even about earning money. It's about looking gorgeous, getting likes, connecting with more people, having lots of followers. That's true currency. Right. Well, I mean, there are lots of reasons why we might, a Marxist would claim that the realm of image and self-presentation and um, marketing and branding um, has become so significant in our society. And there are ways to explain that. And the, I think the way, the primary way to explain that uh, would be, I mean, and, and it's complicated, but it has to do basically with financialization and the rise of property relations being dominant um, and has to do with the concentration of capital. I mean, there's all sorts of ways in which but do, you but, can explain. You know, when, we, when we were talking about him being a moralist, Baudrillard, he mm -hmm. will go in there and talk about the human cost, which makes him, to me, a more interesting and appealing writer than someone who will only ever look at it in terms of you know, the, the labor and, and, and production. Well, look, and so I, I, talk, I want to talk about that human cost too, but let, let, let me, say, just, let me say one thing. I also want to say that one thing. Another analysis that he's shown me is, and furthermore, people are prepared to go the dangerous step that they might not have been prepared to do, do before, which is to say, I know it's fantasy, but I prefer to be there. And it's not just a minority of fantasists saying that, that the technology and the satisfaction allows people to say, yes, I'm unemployed, overweight, and I live in my parents' basement. And I'm really happy with that. I've got this other thing. I no longer need to foment revolution, want change. Fuck all that stuff. I'll just craft and perfect myself. And that is a really serious, terrible weapon against that, you know, that mindset is, is what will stop there being change that, that, that leads to greater equality for, uh, amongst people. And he's, what he's saying is understand that, that, is, that, that you have to be able to talk to people who are in that mindset. And to talk to them and persuade them purely by labor relation talk is not going to work. The, the, there's this guy, Moish Pistone, who died a few years ago, but I, I interviewed him towards the end of his life. And uh, one of the things that he said to me that he was worried about as a Marxist was how the administered society, the society based on state control mm -hmm. and massive corporate control, mm -hmm. was con creating conditions where there were a lot of superfluous people, mm -hmm. people who didn't have any role in production they didn't need to have a political role and what he thought was that you know these the men maybe especially but all of everyone would be relegated to being pushed to the margins and in the maybe in the first world they'd be offered a, a life of video games drugs and masturbation mm -hmm. and and um uh what i would want to say is that um that first I, that i i think that even the uh, the promise of video games drugs and masturbation is precarious like that that there's no guarantee that that will continue and then the, for for on the one hand on the other hand we should remember the freedom that actually uh makes even that kind of nightmare world possible because the foundation of society now 
is a particular kind of abstract labor, which is a kind of human freedom, the freedom of everyone to decide for themselves what kind of work they want to do, to look uh, in the marketplace for work, uh, for a job and a way to be useful, socially useful, um, and to determine who they want to be and what kind of uh, world they want to make. That's what labor as a dominant force in society is aiming at. What, ca what Marxists say is, look, it's gone wrong. Look, there are these internal contradictions to this system of freedom. We need to develop new forms of freedom. Hmm. But, it, but it's not um, that we need to give up on our subjectivity, stop seeking freedom, and instead submit to unreality and masturbation in video games and mm -hmm. uh, but rather that we need to organize to be for a political movement to change the form of freedom that dominates society okay and is, all, all baudrillard who co would completely agree with that is saying but within the analysis that you have to go a bit further in your analysis you know he says it's never too late to go beyond marx and freud and you can't just talk about things to do with production and use value because that shows you as corrupted by any as anybody by capitalism you have to also talk further you have to understand that that um you know the enemy is everyone becoming content creators of themselves and ever individuating themselves in a false way from each other and it's that's that cultural place is where you've got to go and jam and fight because that's a lie but it's becoming an ever more reified truth because of the tools of of virtual technology right well listen we should we i feel like we've uh in this conversation kind of outlined uh two things one what is our our disagreement and also our disagreement about the nature of our disagreement um and so like i like i know that i i uh i don't agree that when Baudillard says um, that we need to go beyond production, that um, I need to hear that because I think I already have gone beyond production, even I, I, as I, I, I no even doubt. as I, I but, no but even as I say, even as I point to the the uh, central uh, significance of production, I, it's not as though my model doesn't explain or have a, a purchase on the realm of it within the realm of ideology or. Or, or like you know, like Guy Debord's Society of the Spectacle exists. That was a um, a Marxist uh, critique of the world of the Matrix, let's say. But yeah, it was but one it's, it's not exactly on. true because it's not a society of the spectacle. And go ahead. We've discussed this before. People are not just spectators; they're active content creators. It's the society of the content creators. That's what it is. Well, no, I agree with that. And we and let's let's uh, when you are further along with your fatal dating, uh, fatal dating. Yeah, there's a little Freudian slip. Fatal dating strategies or fatal dating tips. Yes. Um, when you're further along with your fatal dating tips, uh, you should come back and we should um, maybe do a, a comparison of uh, a text of Baudrillard's you pick and a segment from the Society of the Spectacle and see. Okay. We what, could do that. Where, I thought you were going to yeah. say. I thought you were going to say we can try a dating tip from Baudrillard. Or we can try a dating tip from Marx. So, so no, so. no, Marx. I don't want any dating tips from Marx. I mean, and and, and I would, uh, I, I, I'm much more open to accepting dating tips from Baudrillard. Um, uh, and I don't think I would want a dating tip from from Guy Debord either. Uh, but, but, um, uh, but what about listen, a dating I, I hope tip? That, that, Adorno. Uh, would you like one of those dating tip from Marcus Aurelius? Who would you like to get dating tips from? From Hannah uh, Arendt. Okay. Simone hmm. Weil, she's got some interesting dating tips. Uh, maybe she's Simone de Beauvoir or um, uh, a dating tip from, I, I don't know, a dating tip from Adorno might not be bad. I've received dating tips from Slavoj Žižek. So <laughs> I might. Well, wait, it's dating tips. Um, he told me uh, not to get too caught up in the game of dating where the pursuit of women and uh, and dates became an end in itself. Very sensible. Mm -hmm. Very sensible indeed. And I told um, him to fucking mind his own business. But um, but <laughs> what I said was, 
you're not my therapist, so I don't have to listen to you. Um, but in context, it, it got a laugh and rather than just me being belligerent and contrarian, and he didn't have to rough me up in the parking lot after that interview. Uh, and <laughs> I guess your view is we're not recording. We, we no, I know that's a, that's a throwback to conversation that we had off, off, uh, you know, uh, when we weren't on the, in the live stream. So, uh, but people will have to, if you're wondering what, why I, I might have almost been roughed up in a parking lot recently. Uh, by strangers who I didn't know, um, for things I said in public, you can you can send me a message through uh, Patreon. You can send me a message uh, on Facebook, and you can in some way or another try to reach me, and and I maybe I'll answer. But maybe um, it's a, maybe the new tier in your Patreon yeah. where you know yeah oh yeah the no, new yeah. the new Patreon yeah the new. Patreon tier would be, you know, uh, you know, have a one on one session with Doug where he allows you to rough him up for a bit. If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both.